you. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Yeah, that's right. You get out of bed every day, right? That's what down. Very good. Monday, I got to go in and get the cataract. I'm standing here. Isn't that right? <laughs> anyway, um, welcome everybody. I'm glad you're here and we're going to start a program on the WCTU shortly. But before then, um, I got a few announcements to make. One is, you know, your envelope tells when your due date for your membership <laughs> is. Anybody who is past due. When you get your flyer, please look at it, and Jim is more than willing to take anybody's money. <laughs> we will also take donations for the high school award that we give every year. Right now we have about $540 in it, I believe he told me. And um, the meeting, we got the applications, I picked them all up from the high school today. There's five, and uh, the committee will meet next week. And the most qualified senior that we find will get an award. Okay? Um, let's see, what else do I have? Jonathan, you had something to announce. Yeah, some people may not know this already, but Jane Geist was being honored as Senior Citizen of the Year. just to put in a plug for our summer series of the historic tavern trail of Dutchess County because it actually relates in with the program tonight. So you're going to be hearing about a little bit of temperance tonight and in July out at Charlotte's you'll be hearing about a little bit more temperance but also some very intemperate behavior in the Millbrook and Washington area during Prohibition and our co-presenter you'll hear a little bit from me but a lot more from your own David Greenwood. So we're looking forward to seeing many of you out there. The date is July 14th, which is the second Friday in July. I'm pretty sure this year. And if you look for these pink sheets, they are on the refreshments table back there. They have the full series, which runs all the way through October. And then if you flip and look on the back, you'll see the other major programming series, which is Decoding the Past. It's more or less a history detective style program where we have a set of artifacts, and a panel of experts who go through the actual research <coughs> process. So instead of giving you the polished lecture, they tell you, okay, this arrived on our desk. We have no idea what it is. We found it in artifact storage, and this is the process we went through to figure it out. And just coincidentally, the October program for that series will also be here, and also with David Greenwood, and we might pull Diane and a few others in. So keep a look out for these sheets on the back. And if you have any questions, there's contact information on them. So thank you all very much. June's is coming Yes, June, June, 9th. June Tavern Trail, June 9th is up in Millerton at the new Millerton Inn, which used to be restaurant number nine, which is what I remember it as being right across from the movie house on Main Street. And that is going to be the first time that we've been to Millerton. So again, there will be stories of temperance, but more about prohibition. We've got a major raid that occurred there in the early 30s that we'll be talking about along with some other local color stories. So I encourage as many of you as who can and are interested to come out and join us. That's the second Friday in June at 6.30. That is on, yes, the front of the sheet, and then the back is decoding the past, or vice versa. Whichever program you want to put first. And anyone that wants to sign, send their email address to Will, which I put in some of the newsletters, then you can get the programs that are going on all over the county from other historical societies. Uh, there's one he sent out today, which is down in Fishkill, that will where you can meet Ben Franklin. 
not Ben Franklin like brought back from the dead, but brought the oh. person portrayed. Well, I don't know. You said I was going to meet him, so I just thought <laughs> I was up. Next time I'll put that in the <laughs> I may not have read it all thoroughly today, so <laughs> anyways, uh, so that's always an adventure and I'll, we'll give you uh, other things that are going on in the county it's always great to participate in. All right, okay. Thank you, Diane. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, and then the other thing, uh, we were going to have a tea at the Millbrook School uh, and we announced it for June 14th. It seems as though uh, part of that was supposed to be, the main part was going through the uh, mill. Because they restored the mill, which is now the welcoming center for the zoo. And we were going to get a tour of the mill. But they don't have their certificate of occupancy yet. And since we don't know when that will come in, and since we're doing Charlotte's in July, we figured we would take June off this year and put it off till next year. So we're looking for 2018 for that. But that just came up, and so that's why it hasn't come out yet. So that was that. Um, Allison, you have an announcement to make. You want to come up here too, please? So people don't have to turn around? Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention that we are having the Millbrook Literary Festival this weekend on Saturday, and it goes from 10 till 5. And the reason I especially want to bring it up is that I think we have a number of really interesting historical, historically related programs. Um, starting with Native Voices, uh, we'll have a number of Native American descendants talking on a panel. Um, <coughs> who are all included in one particular publication that's nationwide. Um, anyway, and then there's also Rebecca Edwards from Vassar College, who has worked with David to a great extent on slavery issues and Quaker involvement um, in the Hudson Valley. And she has um, some interesting publications also, uh, 36 Songs of the Anti-Slavery, or Anti-Slavery Slavery, 36 songs from that. Um, and then also Ashley Herbert, who wrote a book called In Defiance, uh, which portrays ads of runaway slaves from the Hudson Valley, mm -hmm. within Dutchess County, even. Um, so those stories are there. And the town of Washington. And the town of Washington, all right here. here. It's very local history. Um, a history we don't often hear about, really. We've been talking about it, but. Um, it's interesting. And then also we have poetry all day over at the cookie shop across from the library. So that can be fun. Tea and cookies and poetry and children's reading corner all day and, and other fiction, um, novels, all sorts of things. So please come. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, talk about Native Voices. The other thing is that we're reviving the uh, oral history program. We're working on that. So if any of you would like to volunteer to be part of that, please let me know. Okay? Uh, we have a committee going, and they're working on, uh, we have a whole uh, itinerary, and then the video camera will be part of the <coughs> Jim Works for our program every Okay, um, and I think that's all. Are there any other announcements anybody knows? <coughs> all right, without further ado, I'm going to start the WCTU program. And the first part of that will be from Robert, who's going to talk about the national WCTU. And from there, we go to David, kind of the local, and then uh, Linda and I will be more uh, presenting the part where we talk about the building. That was the WCTU building in town. Okay, Robert. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, feel free to, to interrupt with questions. You know, cut me off. I don't mind. I'm um, happy to answer anything to go through. I'm going to be pretty quick, 10 minutes or so, and then I'll turn it over to David and Diane, and they'll talk more about uh, Millbrook and the WCTU. Um, women's Christian Temperance Movement. The, the story really begins a few days before Christmas, 1873. 
uh, in a town a little bit east of Cincinnati called Hillsboro. Uh, that town, um, December of 1873, uh, a traveling speaker showed up and gave a presentation. His name is a wonderful name, Diocletian Lewis. <laughs> Diocletian Lewis. And he was well known, traveled around the country, wrote a number of books, um, was very much interested in physical fitness and healthy eating, um, was actually the inventor of the bean bag, which he used as a way to keep women in shape. <laughs> and um, he was also committed to temperance, and in particular, uh, women's role in the temperance movement. He had been traveling around the country giving talks about temperance for, for 20 years by this point. So he shows up in Hillsboro, Ohio, and he gives this talk, and he calls on the women of Hillsboro to take direct action against alcohol in their community. And the next day, 75 women from this town show up at the Methodist Church, and decide to do something about it. They're inspired by, by what they heard him say. Um, and they actually line up, uh, 75 of them, rows two by two, the shortest women in the front, the tallest women in the back. They're led by a woman named Eliza Thompson. She is the, the daughter of a former governor of Ohio. She's 57 years old. She has never in her life spoken in a public gathering much less led a protest movement. But these 75 women, led by Eliza Thompson, march from the church to different establishments in Hillsboro that sell alcohol. And there were really three, and I think this is going to come back when we start talking about Millbrook. Right? There were some saloons in town. There were pharmacies where you could buy alcohol. Right? And there were hotels that served alcohol. And these women, stood right in front of these places, one after the other, and then knelt down and started praying aloud. Right? Praying that the owners of the saloons, the proprietors of the hotels, would voluntarily stop serving alcohol. And they had success. They did this for 10 days, working in six-hour shifts, around the clock. And at the end of 10 days, nine of the 13 establishments in Hillsboro agreed to, to give up alcohol. And this movement spread, at first across Ohio and then beyond. Um, within a few months, there were 110 different cities and towns in the area where every single establishment in the town that had sold alcohol had agreed not to. Now, really, it was kind of a, a fire that burned out relatively quickly. Usually when the women stopped praying in front of your establishment and went away to some other place, you just started selling alcohol again, because the demand was still there. Um, but this is the context for the, the formation of the WCTU. Because there's a woman named Frances Willard, uh, who was born in Wisconsin, moved at a, a young age to Illinois. Um, and she took part in one of these protests in Pittsburgh. And she then spent the rest of her life dedicated to the fight against alcohol. Uh, Frances Willard is a remarkable woman who's almost completely been forgotten from American history. But at the time, she was probably the best known woman in America in the 1880s and the 1890s. Certainly more famous, more celebrated than people that we think of as bigger names today, like Susan B. Anthony. But in 1874, just one year after that Hillsborough Crusade, as it was called, Frances Willard and a number of other women formed the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which quickly became the leading temperance organization in the country. It was the largest women's organization in the world at one point. And they used a number of different tactics to achieve their goal. I'll just mention a, a couple of them quickly. Um, one of the most successful tactics was trying to get schools to teach lessons on temperance. 
1884, in part because of pressure from WCTU and other supporters of temperance, New York State passed a law mandating that students in the state be exposed to temperance lessons in school three times a week. And these laws passed around the country. Unfortunately, most of what was taught in these temperance lessons was pseudoscience, was propaganda, um, the kind of stuff that was in these textbooks that students would use. It's like if you, you know, drank alcohol, it just kind of ripped away your throat. Um, some of them um, taught that a, a single drop of alcohol consumed could lead to spontaneous combustion. <laughs> right, this was actually in uh, textbooks. <laughs> but, um, but they were really successful at, at getting this, this propaganda out. And if you think of the timing here, this is happening in the 1880s, in the 1890s. These are kids who, when they're six, seven, eight years old, are being exposed to this information. This is the group that grows up and is in adulthood at the time that the 18th Amendment is ratified. So getting these kids early, that was their strategy. They were playing a long game, uh, and it, it worked. Another one of their really popular tactics was, was music. I mean, a lot of different reform movements used music. Right? Abolitionists sang songs, convinced people of the evils of slavery. Um, but if you take a look at one of the handouts that you got, this is the one with the staple. These are a couple um, WCTV songs <laughs> that are actually published by the WCTU. Right? Temperance songsters were, were common in the late 19th century. Um, are people in the mood for a little sing-along here? <laughs> I'm willing to do this. I, I, I promise you, if I'm the only one singing, it's going to be very painful <laughs> uh, for everyone here. So, so these, are, these are familiar tunes. We don't have to do all of them. I thought maybe just a couple. Um, if you look at the first one there, the WCTU rally song, right, it's to the, the tune of Yankee Doodle. So you get a really kind of a sense of what a WCTU meeting might, might have been like. Um, so everybody knows Yankee Doodle, right? On three? <laughs> one. We are the WCTU, we have a glorious mission. Our leader is the Lord of hosts, our goal is prohibition. Prohibition's on the way, let the drums be drumming. God's with us and we'll win, for prohibition's coming. Without the ballot, we have left but little ammunition. We will sing and work and pray to hasten prohibition. Prohibition's on the way, let the drums be drumming. God's with us and we'll win, for prohibition's coming. Oh, we don't need you all for <laughs> Right? If, you, if you look at the words, without the ballot, we have left but little ammunition, but we will sing and work and pray to heist and prohibition. Um, so right from the start, the, the WCTU um, is supportive of women's suffrage. Right? There's an alliance between Frances Willard and the WCTU and, and Susan B. Anthony. Um, and really WCTU, and we'll, we'll hear this from David and, and Diane, they're involved in a lot of different reforms. Frances Willard herself supports not only temperance and suffrage, but prison reform, free kindergarten, vocational schools for older students, an eight-hour workday, government ownership of railroads and factories, and a whole socialist element there, right? She embraces vegetarianism, right? Cremation. One of her big issues is encouraging women to wear looser clothing, right? Non-restrictive or clothing. Right? So this is, in part, kind of one of the successes of the WCT. It becomes um, this incredibly popular um, organization with all of these local chapters, like the one in Millbrook. But in a way, also, it's kind of a fault of the organization, because their interests are so diffuse. Right? That they don't kind of narrow in just on alcohol and prohibition. Um, and sometimes kind of they, they get a little distracted from, from that core message. And in part, it's one of the reasons why um, another anti-alcohol organization emerges during this time, called the Anti-Saloon League, which like, has this laser focus right, just on prohibition. Because they think, you know, Francis Willard and WCTU, they've got 
Too many irons in the fire. Um, should we do one one more song here, and then I'll turn it over? <laughs> the, the one the one on the, the front there on the bottom is great because it's three blind mice. And I love the lyrics of this one. Right, so this is one I was thinking kids would sing in school. <laughs> we wise boys, we wise boys, have all signed the pledge. Have all signed the pledge. We signed for heaven, we signed for life. We wore the glow when we get up the strike. We'll all succeed and win a good wife. We wise boys. Win right. a, a good wife? <laughs> The last one here, maybe we can save that to the end because it's the closing hour that they would usually end their meetings by, by singing that song. Maybe we can, can save that. It's on the back page there. All right. um, any questions about kind of the, the big picture of the WCTU? And I'll turn it over. And... What about a little more on how Yeah, so um, right from an early age, as a teenager, she's committed to prohibition. And I don't want to make it seem like this speaker showed up in this town in Ohio and gave this talk and women went out to pray and that started the temperance movement. I mean, temperance had been around as probably the, the most mainstream, the most popular reform movement, at least since the 1840s, if not before. So this is just kind of one story within a much broader temperance movement. Now, was she married? No. She wasn't married. She wasn't married. She had a, a very close friendship with one of her colleagues in the WCT, and I don't, I don't want to assume too much, but um, Anna Gordon was her name. Um, she actually had an academic career. Uh, her family lived in Evanston, Illinois, and she studied at what today is Northwestern, and she became a, a college administrator. She was the dean of women at Northwestern, and she abandoned that when she found the, found the WCT. Um, I, I will say about her just two, two kind of fun facts. She's the first woman to have a statue of her in Statuary Hall in the Capitol. You know, a long time before any of the suffragists right, were uh, commemorated in, in Statuary Hall. There's a statue of her. She was so popular and well-known and kind of beloved figure that four states made her birthday a state holiday. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. Mm -hmm. Thinking. She probably wouldn't have gotten this off the ground if it had been prior to the Civil War that she had worked because alcohol was really important for all those amputations and everything that took place in, in the war. Yeah, and like I said, there, there is a temperance movement before the Civil War, and there are some successes. Like Maine in 1851 adopts a law called the Maine Law, um, which bans alcohol in the state of Maine. It's like, pro, like prohibition, you know, 18th Amendment, just in Maine. But they abandoned after a few years because there's a there's pushback uh, against it. So there is... Alcohol soaked things were Yeah, certainly some medicinal uses. Medicinal uses. Yeah. Right. I would think immigration would have had an effect on it. So it definitely did. And, uh, you know, immigration got tied up with the, the fight against alcohol. I mean, one of the reasons why the 18th Amendment um, is ratified when it is, is World War I, right? Because so many of the brewers are German, and there's so much anti-German sentiment in the country that banning alcohol is, is perceived by many people as uh, kind of another one of these anti-German acts. Well, it's not that, like the nature of drinking is changing a lot. Um, over the course of the 19th century. I don't think that people are necessarily drinking more, but their drinking patterns are changing. Um, if, if you look from 1850 to 1890, so that encompasses the period that, that we're talking about here, there is a 24-fold increase in the amount of beer that's consumed in the country. 24-fold increase at a time when the population is increasing threefold. Okay? So people are drinking less distilled spirits, you know, less whiskey and, and stuff like that, and much more beer. And beer definitely has a, kind of a connection to, to, to immigration. Right? So many of the, the brewers were, were German, like Adolphus Busch. This company is still around. He's probably the most prominent. All right, I'll, I'll turn things over to Anna. Are you next, or? David. David's next. All right.
about our earlier movement before the, the YWCA, um, uh, YMCA. How many of you have heard of the YWCA? Depending on where you are, the YWCA is basically um, started in England, YMCA, and then in the 1840s and the 1850s, the uh, YWCA uh, begins. So it's the first major movement that is looking at women's issues. Uh, uh, temperance was a part of it, but they also looked for things like spouse abuse, orphan children, uh, work days, lots and lots of issues that really brought women together. And that organization sowed the seeds for what ultimately evolves into, not into, but um, encourages the uh, Y uh, Women's Christian Temperance Movement. So this is an example, by the way, from World War I, and you'll look at it later. And it's basically women are encouraged to leave the house and go out in the workforce so that the men can go off to war. And this is revolutionary. To, for women to work in factories doing the men's jobs. So here you see them marching off to work to help in the war effort. So this is an interesting document. Uh, but something else I want to talk about, and it makes it personal. Um, we all have attics and closets and basements and boxes with things in it. And we all run into what do we do with these things? And do they have any value or not? And does anyone um, have any interest in them or not? And here is an example of how history evolves so quickly that in a twinkling of an eye, we're old. How could that ever happen? But here is an example. This is an interesting book, Leading Facts of Geography. Now, we all know geography. We all took it in school. But if I gave you each a test, how you answered filling in a map of countries would depend on what you may have learned in school 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 80 years ago. <laughs> this happens to be 1911, and it's geared to students, and it's filled with maps of South America, maps of Africa, maps of Europe, maps of Russia, the Romanovs, we all know the Romanovs. How big was that? and uh, looking at Italy and Spain and so on. And it's a fabulous document and it also takes into account things like uh, topography, mountain ranges, how do you get from one coast to the other, where are the mountains you have to go over, what are the names of them, what are the weather conditions, what are the food patterns. And again, maps are fascinating. So this is a fun thing to look at. Now, how did I get it? It was thrown out. It was at the dump. <laughs> Who wants it? Guess what? This becomes a treasure. And if it had the name of a person or a school in it, it would be worth even more. So think about things before you discard them. Talk to the historical society. They may be a resource. And sometimes, multiple copies, there may be thousands of these. Who knows? But this is the only one I found. <laughs> And this takes us to something else. How many know what this is? And who wrote it? Who drew it? Sally Gifford O'Brien. Look at the condition of this. It's in pretty bad condition. Throw it out in the dark. Wait. There are elements in it because not only is it the drawing, but what Sally did was describe from her own um, youth and uh, experiences. What were in the buildings? Who were the people? What were the occupations? So even though it's tattered, the text by and large is still there. And it's a wonderful resource. It truly is. And it ties into the WCTU. So Sally, by the way, sends her best to everyone. And uh, the fact that she's part of the discussion tonight means once these have been created, once we add your legacy, your oral history, your diaries, your correspondence from the wars. Once they're collected, it becomes part of everyone's collected history. So Sally, <coughs> at some point, Sally won't be around, but guess what? Her research, her efforts, her energy will be, and future generations will benefit from it. So yeah, it's written, but my grandmother 
had a word for things like this. She called it deer worn. Have you heard that expression? Deer worn? Things that have been used over and over and over again. And they become precious because it's a part of your past and your future. Deer worn. Isn't that a great term? Most of the time you think of care worn with the burden. Deer worn things that have so many wonderful memories. And for me, Sally, when she was doing these drawings and talking about it, and everyone who knows Sally knows what a character she is. And that humor, that personality, shows up in her work as well. Yeah. Something else. This is a Sanborn map. This is 1913. Anyone know Sanborn maps? And how were they used? Okay. The Sanborn maps were designed for real estate agencies and insurance companies. And this one happens to have been one that was used in the village of Millwork, 1913. And it shows the streets, the buildings, and it codes them which ones are wood, which ones are stone, which ones are brick which ones are concrete, which ones have metal roofs, and so on. Because if you're going to insure a building, the insurance ratio is going to change depending on the materials. If you've got a concrete bunker, guess what? The insurance to, uh, uh, for that bunker is going to be a lot less than a wood house with a wood roof and lots of fireplaces. <laughs> Understood? So, but in addition, the maps have function and use on them, and on occasion, the names of how they were used, commercial buildings. This is 1913, and it showcases the WCTU, the building, what was next to it, what the other ones were, so it becomes a treasure trove. And this is another interesting bit, because it was discarded. Because who cares what happens in 1913? I was able to pick it up and talk about Deer Warren, this becomes a real treasure because it's a reference. And from this, I've done so much with the local history. It will be up here later for you to see. So the next thing, and I will get to the WCT. Uh, anyone recognize these? What are they? Pictures, photographs. Remember your brownie cameras? Remember, these are the things that we had all the time. Picture, picture, picture. Notice what? <coughs> There's nothing written on the back, though. So think about the photographs that you have, because they're treasures, too. But not only is it an oral history, take the time to write on the back of them who the people may be and a possible date. Because you may know them, but in a twinkling of an eye, no one else will. I've said this several times, so I'm going to say it again. The Dutchess County Historical Society was created in 1914. And a number of people donated items to the County Historical Society. And people wrote down what they knew about them. And several years ago, we put an exhibit together of the artifacts that, from the society, those that had real interest and, and were some, some were amusing. But my favorite was a teacup. And it was a very pretty teacup. But the entry on it was, this teacup belonged to my great-great-grandmother. It is very, very old. <laughs> and that's it. She didn't say who her great-grandmother was, and she didn't say who she was. So here's this little old orphan teacup. But at the time, everyone knew who she was, whose teacup it was. So that's the kind of thing. Take the time to do it. <laughs> And these are special, by the way, and I'll have them up here, because they are examples of Trip and Hicks. And when Trip and Hicks in the village, one of our stores, uh, changed the facade, updated the facade in the 1920s, it went from wood to, um, to uh, concrete and new windows in it. Take a look at it. And it just so happens that the Historical Society has inherited the sign that's in this building as a gift. And that happens to be featured in this year's calendar in September. Let me show you. And there it is. In the archives, that's the sign. And here are some of the volunteers who 
the work in the archives and the history of it, and here is one of those photographs. So it documents where it was and so on. Those are the kinds of treasures that are under the radar that we're always looking for. So while we love images of your family, if we had images of the barn, the house, the outbuildings, the wagons of your family, those are real treasures because people don't think of uh, saving those, and yet that's what history is all about. Now, the teacher in me. Um, I spent a couple of days creating this, and the archives will have it. And it's basically hard copy, and it shows the WCTU, the building from postcards, and also elements that go along with the uh, WCTU. A membership card. Hold it. Okay. Thank you. So these are 1905 circa postcards. This one happens to be from Allen's Pharmacy, and it shows Church Street, and that's the WCTU building. This one is from Sheldon's Pharmacy, and it's looking up Franklin Avenue, and there are children on the street in front of it. That building is such an important part of our local history. First of all, it was the first building in the area that had a general lecture room, or meeting room, and it was open to the public, to, and you would be able to come in and hear spiritual um, and exciting uh, testimonials about why alcohol is bad. Leaders from all around the country would come in and talk about the sins and degradations associated with alcohol. So that was one part. But they also inspired um, uh, living with healthy um, uh, values and inspirational elements. Very popular. And other groups came in, like the Masons. And the Masons had their meetings in the building as well. They also believed that everyone should have access to books so that you can read. And they ended up creating the first library that was open to the public, that was available. So you could go in and borrow a book, read about it, not only inspirational books, but all the important ones as well. And that book collection became the nucleus for what ultimately becomes the library that we have today, WCTU. Now, some other elements, Miss Francis, Miss Willard, is so important because unlike the uh, YWCA that was very well known, what Miss Willard did was use publicity and she had a knack of promoting the organization and getting coverage for it in the most extraordinary ways. She really fine-tuned the organization and that helped spread the document and everything that they did at those meetings. A couple of other things. It was Because it was the open hall, it was also where you went to vote and have meetings. The YMCA, we all know the, the village hall now, the YMCA had its meetings, first meetings at the uh, WCTU building. And people voted on it and decided, yes, we'd have a YMCA. Now, what did the YMCA do, and why was it so important? The YMCA and the YWCA grew out of the fact that cities were impacting. People were being drawn into the worst conditions, living conditions imaginable. Think of the slums. You'd be packed into a city. And what these organizations did was bring to those poor people in the slum areas, these incredible areas, an opportunity to improve their health, their conditions, and their moral standards. So rather than go out to a bar, what you would be encouraged to do is a healthy sport, like bowling. Anyone know we have bowling alleys? Throughout the village, guaranteed. Because that was an alternative to going to a bar and drinking. And that is something that was promoted. Uh, and in 1895, the meeting, the vote was held in the WCTU building to decide whether or not the village should be incorporated. And guess what? People voted on it, and it was. We've got the village of Millbrook today, and it was promoted because of the why. These are some of the photographs and ads that appeared everywhere. And this is the kind of thing that Miss Willard did beautifully 
group of women <clears throat> being very in your face, and the sign is, lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. <laughs> <laughs> you need a slogan? There is a slogan for you. And there's lots of other reasons. Uh, on this side, if you all have it, this is a project that uh, we did, uh, Carmine and I did, when the building was renovated. You can put that down. Yeah. And you'll look at this later. And what happened to the building is because it had, in 1916, there was a fire. The top of the building was pretty much damaged. It had to be rebuilt. And over the years, other things happened to it. With, uh, when the Rotunos owned it, and the second level of it was converted into apartments, and some of the staircases were compromised, and the interior petitions were made. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But the latest reincarnation is this. And I just pinned it together. You recognize it? Okay. These were the drawings that were proposed and ultimately um, enacted to show the renovation of the building. So what we see today is a close proximity, proximity to what it was. Thank you, it's just another minute. Uh, so this is the paint combinations, the colors, the window, everything that we see today. This document could easily be gone, but it's so important because it does document it. And when the Rotunos bought the building, this was the picture they took back in the early 1930s. And Charlotte, God bless Charlotte, because Charlotte insisted that every photograph have information on the back of it. So she and her sisters, the Rotuno sisters, made sure every photograph was documented. Who took it, where they were taken, and the subject matter. <coughs> so this will be up here for you to look at it, too. Thank you. Okay, great. The uh, <coughs> element. I want to read you a question for you. Talking about the building and the evolution. Um, these are the dates. And depending on your age, let me know when you, you remember this being in the building. So 1882, the building opened. 1887, it expanded. No one remembers that. <laughs> 1916, it survived the fire, but the roof and windows were damaged. What year was that? 1916. Okay. Now, 1917, in April of 1917, that was 100 years ago, last month, it was sold to Patrick Kiever. And Kiever bought it because his building had been across the street on Church Street. And in 1916, the horrific fire destroyed his building. So he bought it so that he could open his store there. Just 100 years ago. Uh, and um, in 1930, it was purchased by Spot Rotuno. How many of you remember Spot Rotuno? Okay, okay, more hands are going up, that's really good. And Charlotte's first uh, store, dress shop, was in the building, and she hated it. So she only stayed there a very short time and then moved elsewhere. But she was in that building. Then, um, in 1932, uh, Jacobson's American Barbershop moved in. And that barbershop went to the second floor of the building. Then, um, here's getting into Sally Gifford O'Brien. She remembers her earliest memories are with Patsy Kiever's novelty shop. Any of you remember yeah, that? Yeah, I remember yeah. that. I was around behind that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it started off in front and then moved to the back. Uh, Grand moved, in 1932, Grand Union moved to the building. And most people remember it as Grand Union. But if you don't, well, let's see how many of you remember it as Grand Union. Okay. Yeah. Right, moving right along. How many remember it uh, as Gregory's Tailor Shop in the back? Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, I mean, he, he, all my clothing he did. Uh, Fitzgerald's Law Office was also in the building, if anyone remembers that. Then he became an antique shop. Remember it as an antique shop? Remember it as a flower shop? Okay. I bought lots of flowers. He's the guy from Pauling. Yeah. 
Then uh, Country Briar Gift Shop. Do you remember that? That's one, one of Sally's favorites. And then Jay McLaughlin. How many remember Jay McLaughlin? <laughs> okay, great. That shows you the evolution of the building itself. And for every building, there's a history and a story. And depending on the sandboard map, depending on letters and correspondence, those are the changes that help to document history. The, um, the last couple of things. This is one of the signs that I loved from Miss Willard. And this was one of her chants. Agitate, educate, legislate. Pretty powerful, right? Mm -hmm. She used that. And, and uh, here's another one that she loved. And that is, do everything. Do everything. Do everything. That was the chant. You know, pretty amazing, pretty amazing woman. Um, so basically, that's my overview of the building and the site and how it evolved and was used. In the building itself, and you'll see some references to it, the, um, the number of speeches, the number of lectures, the number of special events that happened. Oh, and by the way, every Tuesday, um, they would have their meetings. And any election, any service, they would also be open so that you could stop in and have tea and learn wonderful moral issues. Now, looking out, things that we may have and not even realize that we in the society would be very interested in being the beneficiary of. And we just happen to have one right here. Stand up and tell what it is. Oh, this is a bunch of recipes. Oh, for beverages, drinks of variety and novelty. A lot of them are fruit blends, and this one is very practical. Cold tea, sliced lemons, segments of orange, sprigs of mint, shaved ice, tall clear glasses, colored or candy sippers. <laughs> but um, I had it filed under beverages. I don't know when I got this, but it's a WCTU publication. Five cents a copy, 50 cents a dozen. The National WCTU Evanston, <laughs> Illinois. And you said, she was from Evanston. Yeah. So this is the kind of document that you'd, you'd walk by and not even think about, but it becomes such a treasure. And it helps us as we put together our uh, folders on the WCTU. <coughs> and who knows, we may even at some point decide to actually create one of those recipes so that we can all separate it. <laughs> yes, so, yes. yes, so thank you. That's for you. Uh, uh, one other element about the WCTU and the laws, uh, the prohibition laws, um, it, it was never against the law to drink. Do you realize that? That what that meant for the Italian families in the area is they could make their own wine and they could drink it, and they did. Or you could make your own beers and hops many did. Now there were some who did gin in their bathtubs and did something else with it. They tried to sell it. That's where the law was broken. You could drink it in your own family or with friends, but heaven forbid you should would be caught selling it. And that's where the laws become into real effect. And in some places, uh, if you had a hotel, you could serve it with the meal. The, the, your clients couldn't pay for it. And there's lots of variations on that. And each community had an option where they could pass their own laws and prohibition. And so Millbrook itself did that. And I'll turn it over to Diane, and she's going to tell you more about that in some of the ads that they found in the paper. State Historic Newspapers. And if anybody has extra time on their hands and wants to be entertained, it's a great place to go. 
It has the Millbrook Round Table from 1892 to 1907. And you can put in anything for a search. So if you have relatives here, you can put your the relative's name and you can search their had in the paper about them. And it's great. News. I mean, you find out who had the grip and who had, you know, went to visit somebody and who came to town and he was just little paragraphs about everything. All kinds of ads in there for just about anything you can find in all the stores that were in the area. It really is entertaining. And it's really hard to concentrate on trying to find the 461 things that came up for the WCTU in those years. That's how many we came. Where were that? It's New York State Historic Newspapers. <coughs> NYS Historic Newspapers. Okay? And I will put it, I'll put it in our next newsletter so that you have it on the back. Okay. Is that through the State Library, Diane, or just an independent entity? Um, New York State Library. New York State. Yes, New York State Library has done this. And you find them from all over. I look for some for my from Elmira, and they only had one year of something that I never heard of before. But at least we got uh, 15 years, almost 15 years. Anyway, uh, so we're going to I'm going to tell you about some of the things we found on the WCTU, some of the ads, some of the concerts, some of the uh, shows. What actually came up? We didn't do all 461. We're only pulling a few of them out. And By the way, and that the building on the right of, of Robert Church Street is Kiever's. That's Kiever's. And that's the one that burned completely down so that he moved across the street. Because he used to have some of the meetings in town. The, uh, I'm not sure which one's now. It's, it's I think the Masons met get those up lights there. On Maybe, that one. Uh, some of the others did too. And Grange met in the WCTU building always and the WCTU, and then afterwards the Masons moved over there. Uh, the, school, uh, the school board met there. Uh, teachers associations had their meetings there. The Methodist Episcopal Church had all kinds of things there. Uh, they were down Church Street further. That's another uh, thing of keepers. That's the one that David had with the kids out front. Oh, and, and by the way, that, something else. Uh, and that's Ryan, Trip and Hicks next door. The first high school that we had was in that building. The teacher and his students actually were there, and uh, which was really important. And we've got that information and references, too. And the teacher ended up with the students moving into the Thorn Building when the Thorn Building opened. But this was for many, uh, the high school <coughs> on the second level. The teachers associations had their meetings there, their teacher conferences there. Uh, as I say, the Methodist Episcopal Church was down the road. They had all kinds of bazaars and meetings there, dinners, fundraisers. Uh, they rented out their dishes. If you were having a big party at your house and you didn't have enough dishes, you could, borrow, you could rent them out from there. I'm not sure the cost. All I found was the uh, thing that said that that who was in charge and the fees would be the same as last year. <laughs> so I didn't find the actual rent. Um, voting, as he said, was held there. They had lectures, they had concerts, and it housed the first library. And uh, they had a big festival every year to fund the library, the bonds, the books. Okay, so, where are we? Where are you? We're right there. That's the building now, um, uh, Jay McLaughlin's, right on the corner of Church and Franklin. So this is just one of the ads that was in the paper. This is for the Methodist Episcopal <coughs> Church, and the WCTU uh, was at the hall, and the public is invited, and at supper was 25 cents, <laughs> and you'll be entertained with recitals, vocal, and instrumental music, and uh, admission for just the entertainment was 15 cents. And if it's a stormy day, they may not have it. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was September 8, 1892. The next one. 
also in September. That's the Ladies' Aid Society of the Methodist Episcopal Church is having their uh, program there. Proposed to sell all kinds of articles, photographs, and bed quilts to raise money for the, I think that's the one to support them. the work deserves the Lord's yeah, Day. The parsonage. Yeah, that's for the parsonage. And all over here you see uh, somebody has for sale a handsome goat, harness, wagon, and whip, everything complete. Okay. Um, a handsome goat. <laughs> Yes, a handsome goat for sale. All right, the next one. Yeah, the, the, this ad was actually is actually this way in the paper. <laughs> Fit better that way. And uh, this one again is for the Methodist Episcopal Church, and it notes that a hundred dollars was realized to go toward from their sale that was held there. And uh, there was a brass band kindly gave their services. And discounted and discourse sweet music at intervals. <laughs> so uh, the next one. This is where uh, books were given to the library. Uh, two valuable books have been presented to the WCTU library by J.J. Donaldson, and it tells what the books were. State Democratic Duchess County Republican <laughs> on this one. Uh, the church is once again using the, the building and um, what was this one? Oh, this is a speech from somebody of uh, Deliver Life in London by request of the WCTU. So they came to, they had all kinds of informational things there. They have photographs of tours that people had made and things. So this is a one where the lecture is for energy, faith, and time. And it's sure to draw a full house. And then uh, Mamie Smith's concert was, is the next and He's from Canada. He's coming from Canada down to give that. Oh, he's popular. So he's popular, yeah. <laughs> In February uh, 1893, this is the King's Daughters, which are going to give a presentation, and uh, it's got a, going to the part of a French girl, a young American man, and they probably visit the States, and it's all very exciting. Their syntax for their uh, some of the ads and some of the I think the articles are very interesting to me in there. The next one, uh, is a, that's where they had the special school meeting. That was May 1893. The, the Board of Education is going to have a meeting for the 4th District in the town of Washington uh, for the inhabitants of the district to vote. <coughs> A vote will be held at the WCTU Hall to consider the, a choice for the site for the new school. So I'm not sure whether that's the Thorn Building or not, but it may be. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 1893, and the school board and they're going to vote on that. And this is really funny. Um, you know what slug shots are? They're to destroy current and crab cabbage worms. Potato bugs, cucumber <laughs> fleas, yeah, can go something else. Uh, lice, or rose lice, slugs, lice on cattle, fowl. <laughs> That's what slug shots are in the WCTU. <laughs> what promoted that? Uh, December 1894, this one's a turkey supper, and it says that it's the uh, Epworth League. Anybody know what the Epworth League was? Methodist. Methodist. No, was it Methodist? Yes, it was. Okay. No, so that was one of my questions. And it was 35 cents for that. The next one. 
next one is the Teachers Association is meeting there. Their program will include arithmetic by a Commissioner Wims drawings. And then in the afternoon, the Reverend W.R. Evans and the Reverend A.T. Mattis uh, exercise in phonics by Miss Eddie. And there will also be singing. And lunch will be served at noon. So that's the Teachers Association is meeting there for that one. In January of 94, uh, Mr. Nichols is going to give a lecture, and which will be very encouraging to come. And uh, so don't miss his first lecture. It's on the Battle of the Home. <laughs> for the home, not of the home. For the home. <laughs> the battle for the home. <laughs> the next one, this is this was really interesting. This is in uh, May of 1896. And I guess the village had just formed and they were going to have a vote on alcohol here. The first one is selling, this is how, this is actually said how to vote. Uh, selling liquor to be drunk on a premises, which is your saloon license. Selling liquor to be drunk on <coughs> To, uh, not on the premises, and that's your storekeeper's license. Selling of a, by a physician's prescription only on the druggist license, and selling liquor and hotel keepers. And to do that, you had to have six to ten bedrooms in a kitchen. The druggist license is harmless and necessary. The others allow sales to, of any quantity by anyone who can pay for the license and the town cannot limit the number, nor refuse them the privilege. Every question has a knob labeled for and a knob labeled against. <laughs> Press only the knob for <laughs> Okay? And then that same paper on the other side, there's a letter. A very long letter that is from Oakley Thorne. <laughs> Alright, uh, I can't read it from there, so I'm going to out my own copy. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. But the first part, he's telling everybody that they really need to consider this for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and then he goes on to, and then here, as to my refusing a grant to Mr. E.J. Tripp, a license, eight years ago when I was one of your excise commissioners, I did so believing it was in the best interest of the town. We had at that time little or no control over anyone who had a license. And the fines for violation were small. In fact, insignificant. But now the fines for the first offense are $500 in forfeiture of your license for five years. So he goes on to say that he really feels a lot of reasons why they really need it in the hotels. If we don't have it in the hotels, then people aren't going to be coming up into the city to stay in our hotels. We're going to lose all that business. And that business brings money into the community in a lot of ways. And even Mr. Brown said there won't be as many trains coming up. We won't have as many trains because we're not bringing people from New York if we don't sell liquor in the hotels. And mainly the two big hotels. So, that was a big vote. <coughs> and what was the outcome? Just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> next slide, because we have to go look for that one. Okay, you ready? Ah, the election. The saloon license, 221 for, 261 against. Storekeeper, 215, 252. The druggist, 271 to 212, but the hotel was 292 to 206. But the results, though deplorable, was not unexpected. And the places, the no licensed people in the minority, while laying on the other party the responsibility for any evil or good results that we have. <laughs> All right, and this one, uh, I had a hard time figuring out. Failure to grant storekeepers license will deprive druggists of the lucrative part of their business. 
And that's what I was trying to figure out up here, because the druggist got it. But the druggist license is only by prescription. It's been prescription. No, no. You had needed a doctor's prescription to get it from the druggist now before you could go in and buy um, alcohol from the druggist, your tonics and everything, that didn't, without a doctor's prescription. Now you needed the prescription. So they took the storekeeper's license away from the druggist. So it took a while for me to figure that one out because I couldn't do it first. Okay, that's the final vote. Now these are just some other things that took place in town in different places. They had a lot of different meetings. That was in August of 1900. And who were the Knights of Pythias? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Anybody know what the Knights of Pythias were? <laughs> Some Protestant, Protestant, but not the Methodist. No. <laughs> okay. Now this one is March of 1901. And this is the village budget for them. The WCTU, they got $5. <laughs> but you'll notice that the total is $2,125. That's a total budget for the village of Millbrook. Wow. Which we are 116 years later. It's 100 times that. And, our, and it's 100 times that. Exactly. That's how much the, it's increased in that time. Then. <laughs> but I think, I think the WCTU, they use most of their budget for books. <laughs> Five my books. <coughs> From what I... Okay, and this is the last one. No, it's almost the last one. No, it's done. Uh, that's the library. We're talking about the library, and uh, let's see. It's been... Oh, that's when they're moving, right? There's, for more than 20 years, you have stood by us. They were only open one day a week, though. And now they're going to be, it's going to be moved, and they will be open five days a week. And all the books are going up there. And if you, it will give you free access to six, six days a week to the library instead of one and before the annual addition of $200 worth of books instead of 25 or less. <laughs> That's when the library moved. And then after that, you know, a lot of the things that went on in the village after the Thorn Building, the Thorn School, moved up there. They had a bigger place to have all the concerts and the lectures and everything else. So the building wasn't used as much over time. It started to decrease. Uh, the Masons still used it, things like that. But this, this, is, this is before the vote. So you can see what Allen's drugstore sold. They had a beef wine and iron, wine of coca. They had a... Uh, <laughs> they have Valentine's meat juice. They had a malt extract. So uh, they were selling. They were selling their alcohol <laughs> at Allen's drugstore. He couldn't sell it without a prescription after the vote. Okay. Any? That's all I have. Any questions? Yes. Jennifer. Did you find any connection between WCTU people and Quakers? And Quakers, not specifically. No. Uh, David may be able to. Yeah. So uh, what happened is, with the Quaker movement, we've done presentations on it, as you know, the uh, Quakers um, uh, coined the word drab, because drab meant that you wouldn't stand out. Uh, and it was very much in that Quaker tradition of being uh, uh, less than flamboyant. And the uh, Quaker movement uh, was very much involved with abstinence, and uh, not doing anything that could embarrass anyone else. And that Quaker element, uh, as you know, the first group of Quakers also, we did not sing. It was strictly internal. 
and you'd wait for the Lord's uh, uh, presence to say something. And that's the traditional Quaker element. But what was happening around was the Methodist movement was coming in. And if there's one thing the Methodists do, well, two things. One, they do not drink. <coughs> and secondly, they sing. And that element of singing and music within the Methodist movement caused pressure on the Quakers to split. So you had the Orthodox and the Reformed Quakers. And the Reformed Quakers allowed music to be part of their service element. And what happened is that drew many of that Reformed element into the Methodist movement. And the Methodist churches grew and grew and grew. And the Reformed Quakers got smaller and smaller and smaller. The Orthodox, though, <coughs> continued very much in that tradition. And it's the, uh, the Orthodox element that basically uh, inherited the Quaker meeting house that we have today. But for uh, the Quakers, that second, third generation of Quakers were very much influenced by the Methodists and influenced uh, with the Reform Movement. So they were very much a part. That was the standard. And I meant to uh, copy a passage from the Vandenberg diary that we inherited from 1882. And the Vandenberg family was very important in Lithgow. And he documents going to the uh, St. Peter's Episcopal Church in the morning and having communion with wine. And in the afternoon, going to the Methodist and having service without wine. And the reason that they enjoyed going, his, uh, Mrs. Vandenberg enjoyed going to the Methodist was their positions on um, the drinking component and also these incredible hymns. And I gave a name uh, last month that some of you recognize, Fanny Crosby. And Fanny Crosby was a powerhouse and wrote the most extraordinary hymns. Um, how many of you know that name, Fanny Crosby? Safe in the Arms of Jesus is one of her many songs. But her element, why she was so important is, as a child, she uh, had a fever and the doctor I hate even using the word doctor, but the, uh, the person that they took the child to said to put mustard plaster on her eyes to draw out the illness, and she ended up becoming blind. And what she ended up doing for the rest of her life, she had a natural ear, and she went off to a school in New York City where she met her husband, and she wrote the words uh, for the songs, and her husband did the music. And that it got picked up by the Methodists and the Baptists and every kind of reform movement you could imagine. And she was the most popular spiritual hymn writer of her generation, Fanny Crosby. And what made her even more famous was P.T. Barnum. We all know P.T. Barnum. P.T. Barnum tried to hire her to be part of his freak show because people would pay money to come and see the two-headed dog and so on. And everyone wanted to see a blind person who was a hymn writer, Fanny Crosby. And you can just imagine but the publicity from that and what happened in terms of her reputation. And she was horrified and outraged. And the Methodists supported Fanny Crosby completely. Her house, uh, uh, her, uh, house and home in uh, Putnam County are on the National Register. And there's a lot written about her, but a fascinating character. And Nan, what were some of the other hymns? Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. And, uh, but lots and lots and lots of them. You pick up any Methodist hymnal and look up Fanny Crosby. And she's, to this day, she's going to be a part of it. And this is one of my, this is my great-grandmother's life membership in the WCT. <laughs> given to her in 1948. Mm -hmm. wow. so, but she had been a part of it since... Where was she a member? It's in Elmira Heights. But she was part, she was in the Elmira. Methodist Episcopal the Church in Elmira family. Heights for the Gabe's family. her whole life. Mm -hmm. she was, that's when she got her lifetime membership. Yeah. Where was the next closest chapter to us? 
Oh, the WCPU. Major Deer, Poughkeepsie, there was one. Poughkeepsie. Yeah. Major one in Poughkeepsie. My mother was part of one. It must have been Millbrook. And in the late 40s and early 50s. Stanford Hill, I think it was Stanford Hill. Right. And some oh, of there were all over. There were Burbank. Uh, they had conferences. I mean, they had conventions all over in the paper. They were talking about the conventions they would all be going to in different areas. And then they went to the state convention. They went to the state <coughs> from there. Psychiatric Hospital near Seneca Falls was Willard Psychiatric Hospital. Oh, I don't know right where that is. And uh, <laughs> that's where the uh, alcoholics used to be sent to dry out. <laughs> My father was in AA, and I remember, you know, when he would go to somebody that got called, he would be called to help somebody, and they would, they were really in the DTs and everything else, they sent them to Willard Hospital. So, I don't know Yep, it's not even far from Seneca Falls, it's right on Seneca Lake. It's not there anymore. The state park. Buildings are all still there. All the buildings are there. Still? Oh, yeah. Because that's, that's about. Two or three miles south of the uh, <coughs> airport, basic training at the Washington State Park. Right. Are you sure they're still there now? Yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, uh, the last time I was there, I didn't see them, so that's why we saw them. They're like the rest of ours that are deteriorating. We do one final verse. Okay. One final verse. <laughs> <laughs> that's when you get out of here. It's the closing song. <laughs> the end of the so the last one you have, I like the second verse. So the tune here is Old Lang Syne. We go to meet our ancient folk. We'll guide, let us send. King alcohol must be dethroned in our beloved land. In our beloved land, dear friends. In our beloved land. <laughs> and also, remember everyone before we break up, remember the flyers for the two program series. And I forgot to mention that we have a going pass on Sunday afternoon in Red Hook. You punished my. Uh, yes, I do. Oh, okay, good. I think I'm going and we to. Also I, have I have the check. I have the check. Any of you would like more of them? There's no, there was really some. There was uh, some.